I'm going to talk about uh, astrobiology. Um, and I can tell you, give you a little bit of background how I got into this. Um, uh, when I was five years old, I asked my father what the stars were. And he told me they were just like the sun. And I didn't believe him. <laughs> so he bought me a telescope, a small little telescope about that long. He took me out back and it looked good. There's still a few points of light. I still didn't read it. So I had to do a lot of reading. And eventually, by the reading about astronomy, which is a legitimate science, um, I came to realize that stars were indeed just like the sun, but very far away. Very quickly, when you start reading about other stars and other places in the universe, you start asking common questions. Like, is there a life out there? Are there other Earths out there? What is it like out there? Are there are different things besides life as we know it. And that got me interested into astrobiology, uh, which is, um, was probably not a legitimate science when I was uh, a student, but it is now a legitimate science because we're able to test the ideas uh, that we pose uh, in the science. But it's new enough that I probably should give you a definition. And if you do an internet search, you'll find something that looks a bit like this. And astrobiology is the multidisciplinary or sometimes interdisciplinary study of the origin, distribution, evolution of life in the universe. So it, it really is interdisciplinary. It covers physics, chemistry, biology, astronomy, geology, everything you can imagine in the sciences. It, it is the study of life on the largest stage, the stage of existence. Uh, the, the entire history of the universe and the entire expanse of the universe, as far as we can see. It's the story of life. Okay? Now, I've been looking for years trying to find one cartoon or one picture to summarize this, and this is about the best I could do, which summarizes 14 billion years of history. Um, and I'm going to try to go through this in about 30 seconds. Okay. So the, the universe uh, was born with all mass, energy, and forces that we know of about 13.7 billion years ago. Most of the mass that we can see was in hydro form of hydrogen and helium. It really took the next stage of formation, which was the formation of stars and galaxies, to burn that hydrogen and helium into the complex elements like carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen that make up your bodies. Um, Eventually, when enough of heavy elements had been formed, things up to silicon, oxygen, uh, iron, nickel, planets could form at the same time that stars formed. And then planets became common in the universe. Now, and I'll give you the punchline now, we suspect that planets are far more common than stars in the universe. But another thing happened. The universe has progressively become much more complex with time. And the complexity you see, of course, all around you. And this is where biology comes in. And planets play a special role in that complexity. Now, I'm not biased towards planets just because I'm a planetary scientist. Planets are really special when it comes to studying life in the universe, or at least life as we know it. We only have one example, and that is us, life on Earth. And it's tied to planets, so there's a very good physical reason for this. There are plenty of stars out there, but they're too hot for organic molecules, organic chemistry that, that, that is the basis of our existence. So planets and habitability. Planets, here are the, solar, here are the, the planets in our solar system. Uh, they're very diverse. Um, each, each planet has its own story, its own personality. You can see that there are small planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. These are small, they're rocky planets. There are gas giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, made up of hydrogen, helium, with a mix of heavy elements. And then there's a cl class of planets we call dwarf ice planets, Pluto, uh, Charon, Sedna, I Eris, and a few others, uh, actually a few thousand others out in the outer solar system, we call dwarf ice planets. Using water as the criteria for life, you would only pick the Earth as being the, the most habitable or the habitable planet in the solar system. And the reason is, it's a physical reason, that water is stable only where you have enough energy to melt it from the ice form, but not too much energy that you vaporize it. So if you look at our solar system, just look at the middle plot here, um, you see that for sun-like stars, here's the sun, and here's uh, the different orbits, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and, and Mars, you'll see that there's a green zone. That's where you can have stable liquid water on the planet. And, the, and this habitable zone for our solar system, uh, using the definition that you require liquid water on the surface, stretches from just outside the orbit of Venus 
and just inside the orbit of Mars. Habitability requires liquid water on the surface. Venus um, is, is far too hot. Uh, this, this, uh, uh, this little item right here would melt in about five seconds at the surface of Venus. It's completely cloud covered with sulfuric acid clouds. It's raining sulfuric acid continually. Mars it looks like a desert. It's cold. There's no liquid water. Um, and it just appears to be just too, uh, too dead for, for life as we know it. The Earth is just right. Well, that was 20 years ago. Things have changed. We've learned a couple of things that have given us some, some major surprises about habitability. First of all, even looking at these examples, we know of bacteria, the most abundant form of life on the Earth, that can live in the clouds of Venus. Okay? Kind of astonishing. We have terrestrial life forms that can live there. We know of numerous types of bacteria that can live underneath the surface of Mars. Again, both of these objects are habitable from the perspective of the most abundant life form on the Earth, certain types of bacteria. And if you look at Mars, we found a close, which is what we've done over the past few decades with robotic spacecraft, we find that Mars may appear to be dry and desert-like at the surface, but it has had a very interesting history, that's putting it sort of mildly. We know there has been a lot of water present on the surface at some time in its history. Here are some photographs taken by the Viking orbiters in the 1970s, which show canyons wider in the United States, carved by the action of geology and liquid water. Um, a 3,000 mile wide canyon carved by water. So where's the water? Yeah, good question. Um, we see volcanoes that are as big as New Mexico that set 20 miles higher than the surrounding terrain. Uh, this one particular volcano, Olympus Mons, has probably spewed out enough water to fill a small sea itself. So there's been a lot of water on Mars. It's gone. It's not on the surface now. So climatic evolution, whatever drove it, changed Mars from a surface habitable planet to one that looks like it's hostile to life now. But all that water is not gone. Um, some of it is. Some of it broke up into hydrogen, oxygen, escaped to space. But some of it seeped underground, and we now know that there's a large amount of water underground. I'm talking about bacteria. Uh, it would be nice if there were cows and butterflies and things like that on Mars, but we know that's not true. But bacteria, certain types of bacteria on the Earth, would be quite happy underground on Mars, at least as happy as bacteria can be. They would thrive uh, underground on Mars. They have all the requirements, and we find these on Earth. Another interesting thing, which you may not know, and this is a little bit of extrapolation of the science that we have, is that it appears that much of the biomass on Earth, perhaps even most of it, is made up of bacteria that live underground. Here is a, a plot of methane in the atmosphere of Mars, as recently detected about 10 years ago. Now, you might not think methane is a big deal. Methane is found all over the universe. It's in the air that you breathe right now. It's a bit of methane. The fact that we see it there in plumes means that it's being ejected from the subsurface at fairly high rates, enough that this would spread over the planet in a period of a few years. So this is recent. This is something that came out of the subsurface of Mars within the last few decades at best, possibly in the past couple of years. Where is this coming from? This is a big mystery. We don't know. It's possible that this is a signature of subsurface life on Mars. So I hope I've convinced you that Mars is now habitable, okay? at least from the perspective of, of critters like bacteria. That expands the habitable zone in, in the solar system quite beyond this little green zone that we thought of between Venus and Mars. Uh, I've been involved in this since uh, the first concept in 1994. We proposed this to NASA in 2003, got funding, launched it in 2006, um, flew by Jupiter in 2007, and we still have three years to go before we get to Pluto. When we launched it, it was the fastest vehicle ever launched from Earth, 38,000 miles per hour, past the orbit of, of the moon in nine hours. Um, and that's how fast it's going. And we're still three years away from, from getting to Pluto. Um, interestingly, um, we are talking about politics earlier, Congress uh, canceled this mission after we passed Jupiter. Um, and we tried to convince them that, well, it's already on its way, we can't turn it back. <laughs> um, but, but those were details. Um, so, to speed it up a little bit, we're flying by the giant planet Jupiter. 
which is truly a giant, just an example of a scale. Here's the Earth. The Earth, um, hit the, the, uh, the, the Hurricane Katrina, and one of the storms of Jupiter, to scale. The Earth could fit inside one of the storms of, of Jupiter. This is a huge planet, it has a lot of energy, and so we, we stole a little bit of it. A spacecraft stole some of that to sling us out into the outer solar system even faster. But we took that opportunity to study a couple of the moons in the Jovian system. In particular, one of them, Io. This is um, a favorite of mine. I did my PhD thesis on this moon. Not physically there, but out of the moon. <laughs> um, and it's a, it's a very exotic environment. Uh, to put it mildly, supersonic winds, lava lakes. Um, and it does have volcanoes. We've known about that. Well, we took some pictures of this as we passed the moon. Uh, and we saw, surprisingly, and that's putting it mildly, a volcano blasting stuff 200 miles into space. Never seen anything like that before. The moon next door, Europa, um, is a little bit different. Instead of being hellish, it's an ice-covered moon. Has a crust of ice setting on top of an ocean, a salty ocean, that's somewhere between 10 and 100 kilometers thick. Again, all the ingredients for, that you need for life. This is now five times as far from the sun as the Earth is. And so habitability extends to Jupiter. Saturn, okay, I spent hours talking about beautiful Saturn and its rings. Again, showed a lot of surprises, things we would never have expected. Just to give you one example, a storm in the shape of a hexagon that's stable and rotating. We, we did know Saturn had some rings, but we did know it had thousands of them. From the backside, looking towards the Earth and the Sun, we see even more rings, more structure. Now here, I'll get my laser pointer out again, show you that is the Sun, sunrise on Saturn. And right there, I can move my laser pointer so you can see it, a little dot right there, that's the Earth, looking back towards the Earth. Again, I just had to show you some pretty pictures. Okay, but the two moons of Saturn, are, are really key to what I'm trying to talk about here, and that is the biological potential of the outer solar system. We're here 10 times as far from the sun as the Earth is, and we've got two moons that are dominated by organic chemistry. Titan uh, is a natural organic chem a laboratory with methane and hydrocarbons raining out of the atmosphere, creating methane and hydrocarbon lakes, and it has sand dunes, but not made out of sand, but hydrocarbon ice particles that are blown around by winds. Again, a natural organic laboratory. Dozens of complex hydrocarbons, things that are building blocks of, of, of biology. Enceladus, now this is a, another moon of, of Saturn. Again, we're 10 times as far from the, the sun as the Earth is. It's a small moon. There it is showing you compared to, to England. It's not about to crash into the England. It's just superimposed right there. Um, we knew Enceladus was bright. We knew it was a little bit odd, but we didn't know that it was blasting out geysers of hot water that's laced with methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and simple and complex organics and salt. This tiny little moon, 10 times as far from the sun as the Earth is, has a complex subsurface sea at temperatures of 1,000 degrees Kelvin, we don't even know why, and it's blasting out organic chemicals into space. Okay. So just in the past 20 years, our concept of habitability in the solar system has expanded in volume of thousands, factors of a thousand. Okay, so um, let's go on a little bit. This has led us to sort of a new view of habitability. And that is there are probably at least a half a dozen places in our solar system where simple organisms can survive. We don't know that they're there yet. We can count the stars now, and we know what they are. Well, we've now already found over 700 planets around other stars just in the past few decades. We have about 2,000 candidates of, of other planets uh, around other stars, just haven't been confirmed yet. About 40 of these are Earth-like. If we do the extrapolations, what we're what we're getting, and again, this is very rough, it's not a, an ironclad calculation, but we're getting results which suggest that habitable planets are more common than stars. Okay, what does that mean? That means that in our galaxy alone, 
for every person that's ever lived on this planet, there was a habitable planet somewhere else in our galaxy. For the universe, the observable universe, the number of habitable planets are, are, is larger than the number of heartbeats of every person that's ever lived on this earth. Six billion people right now, a second. A six billion habitable planets, a second. But, but that's how many habitable planets are out there. Again, extrapolation, we haven't seen the details yet, but we're detecting the planets themselves. Enough so that we're detecting new categories of planets. Some planets are water worlds, completely made out of water. Some are made out of carbon, high pressure, diamond, diamond worlds. Some planets made out of metal. And there are other categories that we're just now beginning to, to detect. Pretty amazing stuff. Astrobiology is now, I would say, a legitimate, a respectable science. When I was a kid, it was UFOs and little green men and Star Trek. Now we're testing these ideas, these speculations. We're going into the universe and with robotics or with, with uh, very high power instrumentation and looking and seeing what's out there. And this is kind of the science we call discovery science. And it's something that you just do just to find out what's out there. You know, what's around the bend, what's over the hill. You would never predict these things with the laws of physics that we know. You just couldn't do that. With no amount of, of modeling or simulation or theory would you ever predict the things, the surprises that we've seen. It's really about understanding our place in the universe. That where do we reside in the scheme of things? This big story, which is life in the universe. It's a huge, huge story. Um, and it's, it's sort of dominated by two type of, of things I think that are common in the community, two kind of ideas that are common in the community but are not often articulated. And one is that we're always surprised when we sent out a new mission to another planet, we see things that we don't expect. We're always surprised. The other thing, and this is probably a little bit new, is that the universe is habitable just from our narrow perspective of life on Earth. It's possible that what we see in life on Earth is just a very sliver of the possibilities of complexities that exist in the universe. And again, we're not going to know if that's true until we go out and look. Okay, so I, I, I've gone beyond my time. I've gone beyond science, respect <laughs> science. So I guess I better stop. Thank you.